you still have the stamina for this. Yes. I was uh, going to talk to you for half an hour, but uh, I'm a little late, as you can see. And I think my talk is uh, actually 35 or 37 minutes, give 30 seconds, because I have quite a few props, and that takes a little time. So you'll, you'll know that I'm not starting at 9. You looked at your watch, right? And if you look on me with a charitable and sin-covering eye, I'll start, right? Um, uh, without looking in the mirror, what's on the other side of that? Let me hear it from out there. Increase. Increase. Yes, absolutely. A vast increase. And that's the heart of everything. <laughs> When I showed that to my son Bill in California, I said, what's on the other side? He said, a vast land lover. <laughs> I said, them too. Every lover of any kind in all of North America. What we've come for here tonight is not only the vast increase, but also a transfusion. Right? And maybe in some of the graver cases, a transplant. Right? But for all of us, the secret is to have a transformation. Now, when I say you in this talk of mine, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to Canada, right? Through you, because you're the delegates. They elected you and admire and respect and love you and will be guided by you to get that vast increase. So remember, when I say you, I mean Canada. And maybe you. You decide that, right? This, I think, is going to be, to me, is going to be a wonderful convention. I hope it will be a turning point in the teaching history of Canada because of one thing, this finger, this one. Keep watching that during the course of the evening and you'll decide if that's true. It has nothing to do with me. I mean the finger, in a way. But you see, in my deep love for Canada, which I'm sure you all know, and in my month-long intensive search to find something precious and wonderful I could bring and share with you at this convention so you really want to be like myself to try to become a, a different person, the Blessed Beauty Mahabalah helped me put my finger right on exactly what was needed. So here in this finger tonight I have the answer to all the problems you will be consulting about in the next three days. So aren't you glad I came? Right? <laughs> you see, that's worth 30, 35, 36, 37 minutes, right? A friendly neighborhood hand has come with the magic finger. <laughs> well, wait till you see it get into action and you'll understand what I mean. In fact, to save time, some of you will remember uh, at a conference a number of years ago, my friends always tell me that the five most important words in my vocabulary always are when I was on pilgrimage. Right? So in order to save time, because I had to move along, I held up the five fingers and I explained when I was on pilgrimage. And that when I went like that, I didn't have to say that. And that saved quite a bit of time in the course of the evening. Tonight I'm only going to use one finger to get this, to get this work done. And then on other occasions where I may something, say something a little amusing, I'm going to use my left hand and hold up these cross fingers with cross fingers, the hopes that you'll think it's amusing uh, too, see? So those are the three signs. The five when I was on pilgrimage, one with the magic finger, and this, okay. And so if you're ready with that, now it's that. Boy, wait till you see that. This is gonna do some good things for us. <clears throat> now, what this finger really means is that it's tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. How short the time is, right? How short the time, how short the time. But what it really means is no believers, no believers, no believers. And that's the, really the thing that we're after. On a scale we've never dreamed of before. And in actual, actual fact, the beauty of the words that Michael Rochester read, that was really my whole talk. To become a different person. They were so majestic, so fantastic. What we must become, the whole world, we're the reason for the creation of the world, and all the arts and sciences, and everything depends upon us, you heard that. That's why Baha'u'llah said our cause was a cause that no man could conceive of its greatness. And that's what we, what we have to become. But the beloved guardian said, 
that as long as we were trying to improve, God accepted that effort and you were in that class where you could touch hearts and were like a saint or one of those holy souls. As long as you were trying, you were in the same, almost the same station as the others because God could see your effort moving up so you could change the heart of the world. And if you heard all of that, you know what we have to do during these coming two years of the remaining years of the plan. Now, I've come to, as I said jokingly, to practice medicine without a license. I'm going to use that. Of course, I do have a license, actually, we all do. It comes from the divine physician, Baha'u'llah. And also, I'm going to hear tonight, I hope in the next few minutes, practice a, a few miracles of the divine physician. Baha'u'llah also. Because these years have to be something quite different. And when you leave this convention, you have to be quite different. I hope that you will empty your cups of anything that you have conceived about what you can do for the cause of God when you came. And then when you go out of here, your eyeballs will be on fire. And that people will have to put on their dark glasses just to look at you when you appear wherever you're going to be. Those are some of the things from the divine position of Baha'u'llah I hope to share you may want a second opinion on this. I can refer you here to some other famous world healers. The Bab, Abdul Baha, Shoghi Effendi, the House of Justice, and I could go on over the others too, you know, at the International Teaching Center, but I only have the 30 minutes, and uh, I don't want to take all of that time. But now it's time for the, for the miracles to begin. Here, right? No, the promise is that if we take these tablets regularly, We'll recover. <laughs> we will, and we'll become a different people. I mean, this is so filled with promises, you would fall to the ground numb, as Ezekiel and Daniel did in the presence of the glory of God. Divine infallible promise, right? How about all of you have you had your tablets today? Right? Well, Baha'u'llah said that we should recite the verses of God morning and evening, and if we didn't, we were not faithful to the covenant of God. And that can make a person very weak and puny if they cut out that sort of thing. You know? For instance, both the prayers and the tablets are very important. I remember when I was at that table, that wondrous table, uh, I, it was, well, you know, you needn't say what it was like. You were in another kingdom, you know, and you kept floating up to the ceiling. And <coughs> mentally, they had to get you by the feet and bring you back down to the table before you could go on. It was so wonderful. During my days there, I was told by some of the Persian friends about the group of Persians who came on pilgrimage to the Guardian and kept telling them how wonderful their work was for praying. They were beseeching God with all of the beautiful prayers. Morning, noon, and night they prayed to Baha'u'llah to guide them aright and to change their hearts. And the beloved Guardian said, that's wonderful. But you must also now read the tablets. He says, because the prayers are what God is going to do for you. But the tablets are what you are going to do for God. And so that's why those are very important for you. You're all looking way too serious about that. <laughs> I haven't got to the serious part yet, you know. <laughs> A similar story of Americans who were there told at the time uh, I was uh, in the Holy Land. But they had come in the day of the Master. And they said to him how wonderful spirit of unity they had established on their assembly. They, they didn't think there was anything like it in all of America. Master asked them how many in their community, and they said nine. But they had marvelous unity in prayers all the time. How many new believers? And they said, well, no new believers for quite a few years, but we do have this wonderful unity. And the Master told them that was the unity of the graveyard. <laughs> and had no place, of course, in the cause of God. Of course, we're, we're way beyond that. Don't become restless. This is, this is the end. <laughs> right? That's, that's our problem. This whole thing is the heart of the problem. Well, once again, thanks to the finger that Baha'u'llah helped me put the answer on, I think that this is going to become known as the convention, the day when the dominion caught on fire. And you are the people that are going to do it. Nobody has to tell us what to do, right? I didn't say that. The beloved guardian said that, right? He said the friends don't have to be told what to do. They know what to do. It's all in the writings. What is needed is for them to try it. For the individual to arise and transform their lives and throw wide the doors to a vast multitude of new believers. 
All we really require is a kick in our convictions. <laughs> Beloved Guardian didn't say that. I said. <laughs> Actually, one time when I was with Bob Quigley, he said what we need is a kick in the seat of our cats when we're all the same. I don't think we can do that. I don't think we can we can do this, you know. Uh, if anybody is recording, please take it out. <laughs> or I'm, you may hear me the next time in Timbuktu. Of course, uh, John and I wouldn't mind that. That's in Africa, right, John? That would be that would be all right. Well, unless we make these changes, it's true. We'll have a vast, and I wrote it down. We'll have a vast deficit in the national fund, a vast number of lost assemblies, and a vast headache. Or on the other side. We can have an increase in the number of people who have fallen away from the work of the faith in marriage problems, pioneers returning from their posts, an increase in personality conflicts, lethargy, apathy, you name it, and we can increase it if we only have the two until we reach and have the two together. And that's really going to be the theme all over the whole Baha'i world in this coming year. In fact, from now on again, it will not be this, it will not be that, it will be both together until we reach this wonderful goal which we can set for ourselves. All of us working together to enroll that flood of troops in the masses and the new believers. Well, that was pretty good too by the time he shorts it. <laughs> in simple terms, a beloved guardian said, drown your troubles. Drown your troubles in an ocean of no believers. Shoki Effendi said that, right? I know I've told you this many times, but I love it. It's so true. He said, if you need more thrilly pioneer teachers, traveling teachers, you need more no believers. If you need more pioneers, more no believers. If you need more assemblies, groups, and centers, you need more no believers. And above all, if you need the resources to carry out your ever-increasing work for this world healing faith, then you need a multitude of new believers, and there is no other answer. Teaching, rolling the masses, everything, he said, depends upon it. In a far greater scale than anything we've ever approached or even thought of before. Because I know your community, national community, said wonderful things. And here in spasmodic spurts here and there, numbers of new believers have come in. You're beginning to reach very close to your goal for new believers. But what we're talking about tonight is nothing like that. It is a tidal wave of new believers because the time is short. And without the new believers, we can't win. All of these goals have to have the flood and the masses. We've been, I'm talking about the whole Baha'i world, but this is especially true of your national community. You've been eminently successful at everything else. You've won such victories, there's no need to elaborate them here. But in the area of enrolling a vast number of new believers, the whole Baha'i world, almost without exception, has been a conspicuous failure. Every now and then we hear they've told us that there are premonitory signs of the entry by troops, but nothing that will change the face of the world. Uh, incidentally, I find another with this. What this is one of the things I put my finger on here. I found this to share with you this evening. about what we can do about <laughs> I found this secret formula in a place no busy behind what you would think of looking for it in the writings <laughs> the words of the beloved guardian about say there If we want that increase, there is only one, only one way to get it, which begins, of course, with the transformation of each one of us, and then our national assemblies will harness that spirit of new creation of men and women who will cast the sleeve of holiness over the whole world. Those are the words of Baha'u'llah about what we must become. And here is exactly how we do it. First, we see the problem we face. Humanity through suffering and toil turmoil is swiftly moving on toward its destiny. If we be loiterers, if we fail to play our part, surely others will be called upon to take up our task as ministers to the crying needs of this afflicted world. And how do we do it? 
I would expect you to all stand up and join in like the Vienna Boys Choir on this paragraph. One thing and only one thing will unfailingly and alone secure the undoubted triumph, the undoubted triumph of this sacred cause, namely the extent to which our inner life and private character mirror forth in their manifold aspects the splendor of those eternal principles proclaimed by Baha'u'llah. That was written 60 years ago, page 66, Baha'i administration, and that's why I thought I'd just blow the dust off for it, to remind us how could we not have this vast increase in, in all of this time. There is a postscript, I, I know that I didn't read it, but it said, the postscript, a pencil footnote that says, if not taken regularly, this can result in a terminal apathy or lethargy that can take from you the kingdom of God. So of course it's a crisis. But the bigger the crisis, the better. That's the way we have to face these things. That's not a difficulty. Dorothy Baker spoke to this convention when you were together with the United States, and she said that the word crisis was made up of two Chinese symbols. One meant danger, and the other meant opportunity. So the crisis makes us aware of the danger so that we may rise up and seize the opportunity. And I hope that's what we'll do here. That's, that's our dilemma. We must have that vast increase, and we can only really achieve it when we have improved our own inner life. It's not my idea that we should give any these ideas, and the Master is involved in it. Shoghi Effendi said very forcefully that we can never have these great numbers until we show this love. Let me share with you his words. Without the spirit of real love for Baha'u'llah, for his faith, and for his institutions, and especially the love of the believers for each other, the cause can never really bring in large numbers of people. For it isn't preaching and rules the world wants, but a demonstration of love and action. Let me give you an example of the crisis. This is a January 2nd letter of the Universal House of Justice. I'm sure you've all read it and have thought about it. They, have, uh, they wrote the letter to the Baha'i world and called our attention to a grave worldwide crisis that we were facing. Not one, there are four in the, in the letter. All financial crises of extreme proportions. I hope you've studied it, really studied it the danger and the opportunity of that crisis because it's a thrilling and marvelous thing, you know. You see, the financial crises that are in this letter, this letter, this letter, see what's marvelous about that is that we find ourselves in these financial crises not of something we did wrong, but of something we did right. Isn't that refreshing? Huh? Not because of a failure on our part, but because of a success. Not a, a defeat, but a victory. That's wonderful. You see, we've reached a plateau where we have the opportunity to do wonderful things. New, innovative, soul-stirring, world-moving, heart-magnetizing. The sort of things your National Assembly and your National uh, Community loves to do and has done and why the House of Justice said the Star of Canada was on the rise. Now we've reached this plateau where we could do marvelous things, but we can't do them. We're stuck in that plateau just because we don't have the money. We have neither the means or the manpower. But doesn't it make the heart ache to know that we might have had it all by now if only we had arisen and reached individual souls everywhere? Uh, Second crisis. Very intriguing, the words of the House of Justice. The letter was written to the NSA of the United States, but it so affects our lives everywhere, even here in Canada. And they comment so movingly on the persecutions of our beloved brothers and sisters in Persia that we should understand this crisis so we can act on it. The letter is not, of course, directed to the National Assembly, any of them, USA, Canada, or in the world. Those heroic and valiant defenders of our persecuted dear ones have done and are doing all in their power to protect, rescue our besieged heroes and heroines, and nobody could praise them highly enough. 
No, the letter really is for all of us. To tell us exactly what these courageous martyrs have done. To give to us sitting here in this room, all our fellow believers, everywhere in Canada and in the world, an unequaled opportunity to accomplish the very goal we're talking about here tonight. A vast increase in the number of new believers upon which our future success depends. That vast number of new believers our martyrs have now made possible. It's a chance for us to reap the great harvest. It depends upon what our actions will be in the days ahead. Universal House of Justice urges us to continue to do all in our power, and you are, to help rescue these wonderful heroes and heroines of God, leave no opportunity unexplored, fight for them like lions. But then the Universal House of Justice does point out one danger of the crisis if we want to fully seize the opportunity of the hour. Never, they said, never let preoccupation with the Iranian crises come at the expense of neglecting the seven-year plan and its goals, which would divert the Baha'i world community from achieving the very success that is necessary for strengthening the faith and confounding those enemies and bringing greater possible help to our martyrs everywhere. Nothing less, the House of Justice says, is worthy of the sacrifice of our great precious martyrs. They tell us by their words that unless we arise, we arise with a mighty roar of determination and open the doors to this desperately needed vast increase in the number of new believers, we shall have failed these heroes and heroines of God who have given their life, their all. Of course, what we've done is wonderful. I don't mistake my words or theirs. It's wonderful and helpful. Proclamation, publicity, sheltering, refugees, all magnificent. But beloved friends, if we do not bring in the flood of new believers in that climate they have changed for us, we will have made a mockery of their sacrifice. Don't worry about them. They've won their victory. They're already in the arms of their beloved master and their beloved guardian and the blessed beauty. They've won their victory, but we haven't won ours. Every martyr, man, woman, and child who sacrificed their lives did not die for proclamation, publicity, radio, television, press alone. As wonderful as those worldwide sacrifices cry out against injustice. See, what they've done is that they have fertilized the, the ground and the, the earth of Iran. They've made pregnant the soil of the entire planet with a red river of blood. They have filled the air with the spirit of sacrifice until today it is throbbing and alive with the potential promise of unprecedented teaching. And now if we will arise and seize it, we'll be astounded at the results. These heroes of God have given every one of us in this room a climate of teaching unlike anything we have ever seen before in the history of our teaching work. That's our job, to seize this, this golden opportunity. So I hope you delegates will tell Canada that and remember it yourselves and see if you can arouse among those willing hearts out there some of those teaching ma martyrs that the, the Abdul Baha talked about and some of those teaching martyrs the beloved guardian said were so desperately needed in this day. Canadian believers who will teach with the same spirit of sacrifice our martyrs are showing in Iran. Teaching martyrs everywhere. Canadian teaching martyrs, giving their all as though it were their last day or year on earth and their last chance to become numbered with the elect and the chosen. So that's our opportunity. To act and act promptly as the guardian of the House of Justice said is the need of the hour. Our martyrs died so that mankind might have this better world, this Christ-promised kingdom of God on earth, so it's up to us to make sure that they get it, beginning now at this convention. The air will never be throbbing and more filled with the potential for tremendous outpouring of teaching, beloved friends. You won't be able to look upon each other's faces so radiant will they become if we arise and seize our chance and have that vast, unprecedented number of new believers everywhere 
in all parts of the world, white, black, red, yellow, and brown. That's why they died. That part of it sometimes we forget. Third crisis, and third last crisis to talk about here, the solving of which depends entirely upon the enrollment of a huge number of the leaders, a crisis which we often completely overlook or misunderstand at our peril. For this lack of understanding dampens the enthusiasm, cools down the ardor of teaching, and it's about contributions to the fund, local and national. Because of the crisis we face, these comments I'm going to share with you are inspired by the words of the beloved Master and the beloved Guardian. They are not directed to any particular segment of our Baha'i life, and especially not to those generous, selfless souls who were constantly doing their share and more who feel probably the burden more than many of the rest of us. And the longer we delay winning this vast increase of number of movie leaders, the graver this crisis will become, and the deeper will be the sad estrangement of those who do not understand it. First of all, beloved friends, let's remember that the root of contribution, the word is contribute, contribute, which means with tribute, with love, because you want to not because you have to. The hands of the cause of God always defend vigorously all the institutions of the faith, and they're delighted to do so. The majesty and greatness of the Universal House of Justice, the National Teaching Center, the Continental Board of Counselors, and tonight it is my joy to speak these words of love and tenderness to the heroic generals of the seven-year plan in all the Baha'i assemblies of the world. And they are to you, many of you in the days to come, will become members of National Spiritual Assemblies. So I hope, beloved friends, delegates, that you will be sure to tell that to Canada. That if the friends sometimes feel restless and grumble occasionally, or say, or even do not say, but think it in their heart, that the National Assembly talks too much about money and contributions in the funds. Let them know that they're blaming the wrong people. The crisis, the real problem, is not the fault of the National Assembly. Don't blame them. It's not their fault. It's your fault. Our fault. I didn't say that. Shoghi Effendi said it a number of years ago and wrote it over half a century ago. The Universal House of Justice also couldn't have been more plain and clear. They too told us that the problem with our deficits and lack of funds was not a material problem, but a spiritual one. Both the Universal House of Justice and Shoghi Effendi told us plainly that if we needed more resources, more funds to carry out the growing work of our world redeeming faith, and we would need them, there was only one place to turn to find them and no other. We would need a vast increase in the number of new believers the world over. Beloved friends, I speak with authority and from a deep and tender heart on this subject. I know where I have been there. I sat in one of those National Spiritual Assembly chairs. And I know only too well that every National Assembly in the world does their work in the face of heavy, heart-rending burdens that they can't shake off. There's no way. Almost insuperable obstacles. And every member has to struggle to try and become a better Baha'i and a better person as they carry the burdens for all of us all over the world. Praying, thinking of ways to appeal to your heart, to touch your heart, to urge you to sacrifice for the funds. And we sometimes may have sounded too demanding or urgent, but it was because of our own frustration and longing to see our cause advance more rapidly. It is not the National Spiritual Assemblies who are demanding it is the time in the history of the world, and it just won't go away. I can hear the Supreme Concourse on high calling for a standing ovation for every National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is everywhere in the world, for they have taken these pennies of ours and turned that copper into gold as they defend and protect and advance the cause of God. All right, so it's only inch by inch, but that's not their fault. That's our fault. Where are the troops? Where are the masses? Where is the flood? But it was always forward they moved in. And I can tell you where their hopes are. 
in the Holy Spirit that consecrates the little money we do send them. And that's what accomplishes the miracles you have been witnessing these days. Every national assembly in the world awaits eagerly that vast increase in the number of new believers that will free them at last, at last, to do the great work which Baha'u'llah intended them to do in the beginning. Beloved friends, I shall fly away tomorrow morning to Chicago to share this same message of love and excitement with your co-heirs of the Divine Plan. For both Canada and the United States were given these tablets of the Divine Plan for the spiritual conquest of the planet. And I know from what I have heard already, you are on your way. And of course, I'm going to take my finger along with me. Because this is the one Baha'u'llah helped me to put my finger on the answer for this historic Canadian convention, this world-changing convention, new believers, new believers, new believers, wherever you go. Now, how do I know this convention is historic? Why am I so confident that this vast increase will begin here tonight? Because there are 171 delegates from the crack troops of the Blessed Beauty's Radiant Spiritual Army. 171 representatives of his victorious onward marching legions who are poised and ready and who I am sure this time will not be denied. After all, they will find a way to reach this great increase. After all, the blessed Bob said, any one follower, one follower of this faith can by the leave of God prevail over all who dwell in heaven and earth. Each one of you is one follower. And if not us, who does the blessed beauty mean when he proclaimed, He that summoneth men in my name is verily of me, and he or she will show forth that which is beyond the power of all that dwell on earth. And you tell me, who was the master talking about when he said, In this century of the latter times? That was this morning when you woke up, wherever you were. That's now, right now, while you're sitting in this room. The master said, Baha'u'llah has appeared, and so resuscitated the spirits that they have manifested powers more than human if they will open their hearts to it. And what soul was our beloved guardian speaking about? Are we exempt, any of us in this room, when he said one soul, one soul, can be the cause of the spiritual illumination of the continent? I mean, you're a soul, right? One soul? Wherever I look, I see one soul. And if you still think maybe that's not you but somebody else, uh, as sometimes we all do, then in that same paragraph, in the very next sentence, Shoghi Effendi adds, there is nothing, there is nothing to prevent you from arising and showing that example. And finally, from our supreme universal house of justice, source of all good, freed from all error, sole refuge of a tottering civilization, they have written these words that might very well be our theme for this convention and for our convention reports which follow. Forward then, they say, confident in the power of protection of the Lord of hosts who will use his devoted followers, us, who will use his devoted followers to bring to a despairing humanity the life-giving waters of his supreme revelation. Again, let then the individual Baha'is rise as one man and sweep away every obstacle from the onward march of the cause of God. However unpromising the prospect, Baha'u'llah is able to open doors and change conditions in ways beyond, far beyond, our understanding. More, they promise us dependence upon him, Baha'u'llah, enables the Baha'is to formulate audacious plans, like the two-year vast increase plan that never quits until Rizwan 1986. That, I said that, I was just better. They said enables, enables us, the Baha'is, to formulate audacious plans and confidently carry them through to completion in the face of seemingly insuperable obstacles. And now this final bolt of infallible lightning. 
House of Justice promises us, quote, however hopeless the prospect may seem, Baha'u'llah will reinforce the believers with his hosts and will open the doors of victory before them. All things are in his mighty grasp. And if we but play our part, total and unconditional victory will instantly be ours. That's five separate sources of divine infallibility. Five. All who say we can do it. And we can, and it should be enough. They've already assured us if we will but arise and make the effort, we will have that great victory. From three notebooks, all filled with such promises, and all, this is the smallest of the three, promises given to us to conquer the planet, I'm going to close with these two. First from the beloved Master. Verily the perfect and divine, the perfect and divine power will breathe in you with the bodies from the Holy Spirit and enable you to accomplish a thing the like of which hath never been seen by the eye of existence. I hope your convention will do that. Something never seen by the eye of existence in this great challenge of the believers. From the beloved garden, let us pray to God that in these days of world encircling gloom, when the dark forces of nature, of hate, rebellion, anarchy, and reaction are threatening the very stability of human society, when the most precious fruits of civilization are undergoing severe and unparalleled tests, we, the Baha'is, may realize more profoundly than ever that though we are but a mere handful, though we are but a mere handful amidst the seething masses of the world, we are in this day the chosen instruments of God's grace, that our mission is most urgent and vital to the faith of humanity, and fortified by these sentiments, arise to achieve God's holy purpose for mankind. This is our duty, our first obligation, Therein lies the secret of the success of the cause we love so well. Therein lies the hope, the salvation of all mankind. Are we fully conscious of our responsibilities? Do we realize the urgency, the sacredness, the immensity, the glory of our task? I entreat you, dear friends, to redouble your efforts, to keep your vision clear, your hopes undimmed, your determination unshaken, so that the power of God within us may fill the world with all its glory. So, beloved friends and delegates to this historic convention, let us take up that challenge. And here tonight in Ottawa, vow that we will never set it down for two long years until Rizwan 1986. Triumph filled years at which time we shall all be swimming for our very lives in the midst of that vast tidal wave of new believers which will have drowned all our brothers. Beloved friends, the hands of the cause of God are the remnants of the beloved garden, his tattered, willing, but aging standard bearers. But even so, our spirits remain quite fierce and strong, and we shall still raise that glorious ensign on high. And we shall march with you, side by side, into the valleys, over the mountains, and across the prairies of Canada, if you will arise and do the same. Igniting such a burning, raging fire of teaching across the face of this dominion, that nothing will stop us, nothing in our spiritual conquest of this nation. That, beloved friends, is the heart of all I came to say to you tonight. And I will leave you. I will leave you with a gift. A short prayer from page five of selections from the writing of Abdul Baha. It is short enough to carry in your purse or in your wallet. 
And you can say it if it touches your heart, along with your other favorite prayers. These prayers, our beloved Master once said, are a weapon to fight with forever and ever, and with them we shall always be victorious. O oh God, my God, I beg of thee by the dawning light of thy beauty, by thy streaming clouds of bounty raining down gifts, to help thy chosen ones and cause them to gain the victory through the battalions of thy might that overpower at all things and reinforce them with a great fighting host from out of the concourse on high. Please remember me in your prayer. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to listen to more content on the Oneness Movement, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment. See you next time.